Hello everyone and welcome back to AMOS, our course on Agile Methods and Open Source. We are now starting the fourth part of the course on Software Product Management uh, for Software Product Vendors or Project Management for Consulting Firms. More specifically though, since this is an Agile Methods course, we will focus on the Product Owner, which uh, is only about a subsection uh, sub part of product management. So our agenda uh, for this talk is to introduce or reintroduce this time in depth what a product owner is and then go over the different artifacts and work outputs that they generate and that they work with during the course of an Agile Methods project. So the product owner um, Within software development, uh, we already know there's a key function called uh, product management. Um, its job is to make sure that the company's products are managed properly from a business perspective. A company may have many different products. Uh, they may in different, be in different stages of their life cycle and so forth. So in general, a product manager has to answer, always has to have to, the answer to the question, what is it, what is it that the company is supposed to be doing? Implied in what is also the question of significance or importance? What is more important than something else? So what of the many different things that you might be doing has to be done first? Is the second question a product manager has to answer. So in traditional software development, they are actually called product managers. In Scrum, there's only the product owner. And the product owner is, as we will see, at best a technical product manager, not so much a strategic product manager. You may remember how strategic product management is mostly concerned with the business opportunity and technical product management is mostly concerned with the details of getting the product or the software done right. So in this course, Amos, we will help students understand product owners or technical product managers in our other courses, most notably on software product management, broad or commercial open source software startups course, uh, you will learn about strategic product management. The Scrum product owner combines, therefore, are the roles or some of the roles of a traditional product manager and an engineering manager, as we will see. So in Scrum, the product owner has overall responsibility for what is being developed, which specifically leads to a product goal and detailed requirements. In addition, the product owner also plans, helps plan, and tracks the progress of development in collaboration with the software developers. So here's a basic uh, overview of uh, classic traditional processes that a product manager or product owner is responsible for and what it means in the context of Scrum. So for most notably, uh, the business aspects are pretty weak. There is a product vision or a product goal, and that's about it. Uh, the product owner, as a technical product manager, is responsible for product specification, planning, and tracking. And then there are the associated artifacts that we will be discussing in this and the next lecture. The product owner therefore focuses on scope, what is it that needs to be done, as well as what's more important now rather than later, time. The product owner's focus is not quality, arguably quality, code quality, uh, freedom, if any, from bugs is the software developer's uh, job. So product goal in Scrum 2020, in the Scrum 2020 guide, 
Schwaber and Sutherland introduced uh, product goal as uh, something to drive and give meaning to the project or the product being developed. So, but let's take a step back here. Um, from my own classification, we know that a strategic product manager does opportunity assessment, see the business value. This implies market research. What is it that potential customers uh, want? Scrum doesn't really talk about that, so it's outside the scope of Scrum, even though it's always in the background, because if you don't know what you're doing and why you're doing it, how can you be a good technical product manager? You cannot be, there is no good technical product manager without a good strategic product manager. These are roles, so it could be the same person, but somebody needs to strategically think about what you're doing. So what Scrum does offer is the idea of a product goal, meaning what is it asking, answering the question, what is it that we are after? And in the Scrum 2020 guide, it is a single goal that is part of the product backlog. But for the Amos project, um, as an agile methods project at a university, we have split the goal into a product vision and a project mission. So let's get back to our example, the Waldside Flowers application. So you can see a screenshot here. And that is a web application for flower enthusiasts. The vision behind flowers is something like this. Help flower enthusiasts connect to each other, showing photos, talking about gardening and flowers, and so forth. Also in there is a business purpose. Flowers is the best place for producers and sellers of gardening supply to reach those enthusiasts who might be buying from them, who might be their customers. So it's uh, uh, these two aspects in one short statement. That is a product vision. Please note that this product vision has no time associated with it. Arguably, it's timeless. It has no particular end date. So it keeps evolving. The world changes. And hence, uh, the, and the, but the vision stays stable, but what the vision means in a changing world is constantly being adapted. That's the idea of a vision of a better world because of, say, this application. In contrast to something that is open-ended, has no end date, we do have projects. Remember, by definition, a project is something with a start and an end date. Uh, the course is called the Amos Project because it has a start date and an end date. So it's a project with a defined uh, time span. So now we have, therefore, a project mission which spells out what you can possibly achieve within a defined time frame. The mission of this or a particular Amos project is to create an MVP for Wildside with flowers. And the core functionality is showing and rating photos, basic user management, etc. So arguably the mission is pedestrian. It's very straightforward here for an Amos project with a three month time horizon. It's also pretty predictable. But the key is the project mission is the mission of a project with a start and an end date, which is very different from the vision of a world which would be a better place, but with no timeline on the vision. For Amos, to make sense, you need both. The vision, which explains to you why you're doing this, and the mission that tells you what you can possibly achieve and can commit to achieving as a team. As a product owner, you need to describe, communicate, well, first elicit and then describe and communicate what students or what uh, the team, the development team is supposed to do. And in traditional terms, the product manager is responsible for a domain model, 
um, together with engineers where the domain model is an analysis model and captures the key concepts of the original domain. So a good product manager knows these key concepts, knows them down to quite some level of detail. You cannot leave it to developers to know the details on the domain level. So if you're doing financial software and you don't know all the ins and out of interest rates, well, then you're not doing a good job as a product manager. In Scrum, where we don't have any heavyweight thing like a domain model or so, we um, uh, don't make it make life easy and use a glossary. A glossary is a, a set of term definitions which is much simpler than the traditional domain model which you would usually describe using uh, UML or some other modeling language. So product owner in Scrum, as we teach it, is responsible for creating a glossary and maintaining that glossary, where the glossary consists of the core domain terminology that users of the software uh, are using. So for wildside flowers, obviously photo is a big, photo rating, photo sharing, all of these are terms that need to have a precise meaning. If it was a financial domain software, maybe loans, uh, commercial loans, you would have to know and talk about interest rates, different percentages, different types of loans, different maturity rate, um, periods, and so forth. This would be the domain vocabulary that you need that the experts of the domain, your customers speak, and that you need to understand so that you can develop good software for your users. So these entries in the glossary, so the glossary is the set of entries and then the individual entries are short term definitions. One word, that's the term, and then a sentence, rarely longer than a paragraph, more than one sentence, uh, the definition of that glossary entry. Think about it in object-oriented terms. Um, and uh, interest rate is a percentage, so is a, you're specifying specific terms in more general terms. Avoid uh, weasel words like relates to or uh, things like that. Think hard about the precision in, your, in the words you use. And then again, the purpose of the product glossary is to give you those words that you use in the specification of the software to be developed. Uh, the product vision is very high level, with not a lot of domain terminology. All the domain terms come in through the glossary and are being put to use in the product backlog. So all these three components uh, these three artifacts all need to be consistent with each other. You can't be using different domain terms in the product backlog than in the product glossary. If there are contradictions, you'll just be annoying everyone or confusing everyone. So, as I said, use is a, a is a, b with a special provision for something or that. Um, also add synonyms to your glossary and so forth, shorthands, etc. So people, developers, as much as users, can use the glossary to look up how you understood and defined the key domain terms. Here's a quiz. We'll go over it in the class session. Now then, the product backlog, where much of the action of work is for the product owner. The product backlog uh, contains the ever-evolving product specification. And so it's that list of features that are awaiting implementation. Every feature, every functionality that ever was implemented passed through the product backlog. So the main activities of a product owner are in the description or specification of features and the prioritization of features, put them in order and the management of them 
as they go through different study, meaning they're being implemented, they are being rejected or accepted, and so forth. So here is a basic example of a product backlog, also from uh, Flowers, using a spreadsheet. You can see here how there are rows, where each row is a product backlog entry. And so for each entry, uh, each entry is a feature specification, has a name, has a description in the form of a user story, has acceptance criteria, and so forth. So the product backlog is that prioritized list of product backlog items, where product backlog items can be features, and the way we handle it in the Amos project can also be bugs and refactorings, uh, as if those are not solved as part of regular development. It really is what traditionally has been called the product requirements document or a Scrum's version of it, arguably. The product backlog um, is not tied to time. It has a prioritization of items, but it doesn't say anything about when work is supposed to get done. It's really just a priority, a list of prioritized entries and keeps changing. In terms of quality, it's obviously about the business value that you are supposed that you want to generate. Um, the product backlog near the top, where near the top means the most highly prioritized items, the quality near the top has to be high because this is what developers will be working with. Further down, meaning weeks or months out in terms of being implemented, the quality can be lower because it doesn't have to be ready yet. But those at the top need to be top and need to be of high quality. There are different ways of uh, managing the product backlog and the items therein, different properties the uh, items should have. At a minimum, they need a name and a description. Usually next to the description, there are acceptance criteria, should be acceptance criteria. So we, for example, require them, which spell out, uh, well, criteria by which the product owner will accept or reject the feature as having been fulfilled or not. A long time ago, this is how a product backlog looked like. People work with index, index cards. As a historic aside, um, the creators or the original agilists argued that you should be physical, should be co-located, you should be standing as people in front of such a board and so forth. I think this was basically uh, a bit of cult generation so that uh, those who did Agile as the pioneers, um, while not necessarily feeling or thinking they were part of a cult, they got that in-group, uh, that leadership, that pioneering feeling and hence the early days Agile methods, whether it was Scrum or Extreme Programming or any, something else, did a lot of weird things that made no sense except that it made sense from the perspective of wanting to be different. All of this has come home now and we use online, we use tools for managing backlogs like anyone else would use tools to manage a product specification. As I already mentioned, uh, product backlog entries can be of different types. Uh, the most common one is the feature, the distinguishing characteristic of a software item. Also, it could be a desired refactoring to clean up uh, the software or a bug report to fix a problem with the software. Some Agile methods proponents say that a refactoring or a bug report do not create business value and hence should not be in the product backlog. I'm indifferent, but I do realize how eager students are to show the work they are doing and that if we don't allow for refactorings and bug reports to be acknowledged as explicit pieces of work, then they will probably not be done. So if a bug is substantial and doesn't get solved on the fly, 
uh, put it into the product backlog, let the product owner decide on whether it's important or not, and channel it into development through the product backlog. When we talk about features, going back a step, uh, stepping back, uh, we can distinguish between a small fine grain feature, um, often then in the form of a user story, which is so small that development, a developer can pick up that feature in an upcoming sprint and fully implement it. So the user story or the feature is so small it's ready for implementation. Sometimes, however, before that you have features that are so big that they don't fit into a sprint. Uh, we call them epics, or they are being called epics because they are, well, so large and they need to be broken down further into smaller features, all of which still have business value. So large-scale items like um, um, uh, be able uh, to print a document or be able to manage a process, a workflow, uh, is just too big. Uh, to, uh, to um, be picked up in one sprint. And so the product owner nevertheless puts an epic into a product backlog, but it cannot be at the top because it can't be highly prioritized because it's just not ready yet. And so epics are put into product backlogs and get refined and broken down into smaller features over time. And then it is the smaller features that bubble to the top, get highly prioritized and eventually get implemented. An epic can be used or viewed as a theme. So we can break down an epic into multiple features and track the implementation, the overall implementation of the epic, be able to manage workflows um, by which of their smaller individual features have already been implemented. So you make the epic a theme um, and uh, track, break it down into 15, 20, 30 uh, different features, smaller features, and track the completion of the epic by tracking which of its constituent features have already been implemented. So here is a, the implementation of a simple, not so simple, non-trivial size feature, the Telefriend feature, so basically a page uh, in the Wildside Flowers application where you can send, where a flower enthusiast can send their friends an email about, uh, about this website, the Flowers website that they just found. With the product backlog in place and understanding that in the product backlogs the individual entries are individual features, we now need to ask how do we specify, how do we prioritize, how do we manage those features the product, uh, the, in the product backlog. And you already know that we use user stories, but this is really only one way of doing it. Uh, to make this point more explicit, let me step back again and point out the two fundamentally different ways of describing features or specifying features. And in the past or traditionally, people believed that features needed to be fully specified. So a specification was only a good specification if it captured if it captured the feature completely, meaning nothing was left out and so there were no misunderstandings possible, no holes, and as a consequence such a specification could be used for example in writing contracts uh, between, um, between a customer and a consulting firm doing the project for the contract. And that would be done in prose, maybe UML use cases. And the obvious problem is it's just paper heavy. You ended up when you, if you try to specify a whole system with hundreds of pages of uh, specifications, 
that most certainly were inconsistent, had bugs and so forth. So that goal of that goal of complete and correct specification is basically unreachable beyond trivial trivial um, scenarios. In contrast to the idea of complete specifications to be used in contracting, Scrum relies on the notion of illustrating, describing illustrating features for the purposes of stimulating a discussion. There is no implication that a feature description or illustration is complete. Quite the opposite, it can be sure it's incomplete. But the point is that whatever is written down, has been written down, is good enough to trigger and guide some of the discussion between a product owner and software developers. So that in the minds of the involved people, a consistent picture emerges. Relying on human intelligence, for sure, and so obviously it can also go wrong, but putting the illustration, as we know, into a feedback loop where any mistakes and problems will surface quickly and can be corrected. So a traditional specification can be done using pros and UML use cases. An illustration can also be done using pros, but also can be done using user stories. The simple ones we use following the sentence template or more or lengthy ones using pros, regular user stories that actually describe the steps people take and so forth. And there are various uh, other forms of structured sentences to illustrate but not completely specify a desired feature. So here is the simple user story that you already know as a flowers user. So the example, I need a function to tell a friend about a flower photo so that I can share my passion. Um, as you know, as a user, I get some functionality so that I get business value out of it. That's the sentence template of the user story. Great for starting discussions, really unsuitable for contracts. But even such simple user stories have a reason of existence and some value. So as your father, I want you to clean up your room. So role father, function clean up your room, business value missing, or at least challenged by the girl in this cartoon. You can have a regular user story where you just walk uh, the reader through the steps. It's more elaborate than the simple user story, still not really suitable for contracts. Also quite popular are structured sentence templates beyond user stories. Um, so for example, the more traditional, the system, must be able to print a document in the network on a network printer. And then there's semantics or meaning assigned to each of these sentence components so that you can do some magic uh, with it. So first of all, parse it for correctness and completeness, even if it's just prose. So you don't forget like in the previous cartoon, the business value, for example, but um, even that is not really a complete specification. Flowers must allow the user to send an email to a friend about the photo they were looking at. That would be following that sentence template. Still open to interpretation, may or may not be used for contracts. Here I write it's suitable for contracts because that's how people use it. That's because these sentence templates have a long history and tool support. I'd argue that they're still will be holes and so buyer beware you do not get complete correct specifications even with more elaborate sentence templates. But the still dominant way of specifying requirements uh, in the industry is just using prose. So the telefriend feature feature ex example explained using process, a user can click and then do this and then do that. Um, it's really a model of what's supposed to be done. It tries to be complete usually, but 
it still has these uh, problems that uh, that it's just not necessarily consistent, too easy to make mistakes, etc. So UML use cases came along, tried to give it uh, even more structure. So this is only a subset of the fields that a use case in UML can have. It's the typical pitfall of plan-driven software development. Uh, it just keeps growing. Um, holes, loopholes are found to fix them. Additional fields or additional information requests are filed, but it's just never enough. So use cases, nevertheless, are very popular in industry and you might face them in a job after school. In addition to specifying what, what it is that the product owner or product manager wants the team to do, they need to define quality criteria or checklists to help them help the team understand when they are done. And that's what acceptance criteria do in, uh, in Scrum. Uh, they are additional criteria put next to the user story. They are propositions that must be true before the product owner is willing to sign off on a successful implementation. So it's a statement like the email is being sent uh, out. Uh, um, whatever it is that is feature specific, that indicates that the functionality that implements the feature is complete and the job was finished. It can be one or multiple criteria for a given backlog entry. So it's either a single proposition or a list of propositions. In addition, you need to estimate size or we want you to estimate size or complexity of uh, any feature you're implementing. And so we use the already introduced story points. Um, they are arbitrary and they are really, uh, this is the Fibonacci uh, here, they're really a categorical uh, scale, even though we're doing math with it. It's really mostly, are they of the same size? Then give them the same points and they have an associated name with it, small, medium, large effort. That's usually where you end up with your features because a good product owner makes sure that features are of a size that fits into the scale. If the development team thinks a 13 is too small still even for a feature, then the feature was not well specified. It was an epic, it's imprecise, or it's just too large. And so giving it a 13 for too large is basically a rejection by the team uh, of a feature description, a rejection to back to the product owner because the team doesn't believe it can be done within a sprint. These size, sizes, complexities are supposed to be independent of a person. So you need to be disciplined or students need to be disciplined as they are uh, estimate size of features in that they should not be thinking about so much how long will it take me but rather what is the size independent of a particular person. Over time you will come to an agreement it just takes a little bit of uh, adjustment in the beginning but then usually works pretty small pretty pretty easily pretty straightforward. So again size does not depend on people. Effort, which we don't use, is more of an estimate of duration and it's dependent on the implementer. We don't want that. We have a fixed size team. Everyone's always there. So the total amount of work that can get done is fixed and hence the total amount of story points to be done in a sprint should also be roughly the same. Every sprint at least all the, during all the later sprints where you've learned, learned how to do it. The quality criteria for, for feature descriptions, the invest criteria, I think they are straightforward. Features should be independent of each other. Uh, you should be able to negotiate them. This is more a hint towards the product owner. Uh, you can push back on that. 
uh, what a product owner says because even developers have domain knowledge and understanding of, of users and customers. They always should have business value. They should, should be possible to estimate the size. They need to fit into an iteration. And of course, they need to have testable success criteria. So another quiz, we'll go over that in, during class. So we just talked about how to describe features. Now we need to talk about how to prioritize them. So let's assume that we have a set of features all well described. The question now is how do we put them in order? Which one should be done first? Which second? Which third? In a sheet, sheets, spreadsheet-based product backlog like this year, we, we usually would say or in the past said that the items at the top are the most highly prioritized and the one at the bottom are the least highly prioritized and so that's that order indicates the priority. We do the same with Kanban boards. Uh, what's at the top is the most highly prioritized one. What's at the bottom is uh, not. But we need to relate these product backlog entries, the features, to each other to, um, to determine how to order them. And perhaps the uh, easiest, so there are multiple techniques of how you relate features to each other to know which one's more important than the other, which gives you a partial ordering. And then you can align these partial orders into a total order. Um, one, one model is to assess each feature by value and risk. So it's very straightforward to argue that high business value should come first. There's no point in doing something that has low or little business value. Always do what's of highest value first, because later on new things may come which may be even of higher value. And if you then did something low value first, you now have multiple high value items not yet to be done. So always go for high value of features first. That's one dimension. The other dimension is... Um, risk. How difficult will it be to successfully to successfully implement a feature? And you may think that you go for low risk first because then you're sure to get it done. But that's actually exactly the wrong way. You should go for high risk first and low risk second of high value features. Why? Because if they have high value, then you know they need to be done. And then if you know they need to be done, you want to know if there are any problems right away. So high value, high risk first, high value, low risk second. And then you can do low business value, low risk next. Because, well, if it's low value, it's not that important. So choose the low risk ones where you know you'll get results first. And those of low value and high risk, you probably will, will never do. So high value, high risk first. Another way of looking at it is that is the Kano model, where you classify your features into three categories and you need a balance of, uh, of features from each of these categories. There are those features which you absolutely must have so you need to be working on them if you cannot register a user if you cannot print a document then the system is hampered and users will just be frustrated. Um, so these are must-have features. Then there are performance features where um, users get more value out of them as they are done and they are fine. They are not necessarily expected, but that's why the software exists. Nobody comes to a software for must-have features. They come for performance features. And they come for the third categories of exciters and delighters. Exciters and delighters are features that are novel that are the innovation behind the software. They really 
make the product shine, they put the wow into the mouth of, uh, of the customers. So you don't need a huge amount of Exciter Centilitis, but you usually need some because overall customer satisfaction depends on this novelty, the new thing, the final problem solution, the surprising but final problem solution they were all waiting for. Yet another one as a categorization mechanism is uh, to put features into one of these three categories, uh, high, medium, low, or essential, conditional, optional. What's the problem with this categorization scheme? Well, if you ask your customers, everything's essential. So you need to uh, limit the volume. You need to say they need to have the same numbers of features in each, which will be hard because customers are customers. They will tell you everything's important. So in class, let's do a little exercise on how to prioritize these features. We'll do it then. All of this, these techniques I just showed you, um, you apply them, they give you partial orders, and then you need to align those partial order into a total order. There are also ways of waiting, uh, creating a total order of features if the set of features is finite. So that's the, in particular, the Uyghurs waiting practice, um, where you basically come with a model of the value of a feature, assign points to each of these dimensions in the model, like the customer benefit, customer penalty, and so forth. Turn it into a formula, and that gives you uh, a value that you can maps the feature into a linear scale where the value then determines the position in a rank ordered uh, list. It's very, fairly laborious as you can see, uh, so it's questionable when exactly it makes sense to invest that much effort into uh, prioritizing features, but uh, sometimes it may be appropriate. Problem still is that it only works for a finite set of features, so you need to redo it over and over as more features are being added, say, to a product backlog. So after describing slash specifying and then prioritizing features, you manage them, you go through the process that you already know with the uh, uh, sprint planning and so forth. And eventually you will have to uh, you will have features that have been properly implemented so you need to archive them so that's the feature archive a list or a column in a Kanban board of all those features where the product owner said they have been done they have been done properly and so rather than deleting them we save them for posteriority well no mostly for showing this is the functionality that we already have. Sometimes you need that. It's the current state of the software as implemented so that you can take a look at it and have a history of who did what and when. So then we talked about the Scrum Product Manager in this uh, section of the fourth part on product management or the product owner role and looked at the main artifacts. And next time we will look more at the planning and tracking processes. With that, thank you very much for your time and attention and see you in the next upcoming section.